Next we will look into what is high quality testing. Let's start out by having a look of this figure. On the x-axis we have software product quality. In previous lectures we extensively discussed software product quality dimension. On the y-axis we can see the testing quality dimension. So in the bottom y we have low quality testing and in the top y-axis we have high quality testing. Okay, let's start by looking at these different quadrants. So obviously all software development organizations wish they would be in the top right quadrant that is characterized by having high quality software product and doing high quality testing. If we look into the number of defects in this quadrant, we can see that it is low due to the high quality software product. So, moving to the quadrant on the top left. There we have high quality testing and low quality product. Since we do high quality testing on a low quality product, we obviously end up with many defects in the defect reporting database. So now we move to the quadrant on the bottom right. So there we have high quality product, but we do low quality testing. Also in this case, we would have few de defects on the defect reporting database. This is due to two reasons. We have high quality product that doesn't have many defects to begin with, and we do low quality testing. So shall there be any defects, we would not find them anyway. So now we jump to the final quadrat that is on the bottom left. There you also have a few defects in the defect reporting database. Uh, you do low quality testing on a low quality product. However, as the testing quality is low, you find few defects and you are therefore unaware of the low quality of the product. So overall, we can see that in three out of the four quadrats we have few defects. So the number of defects that we find is affected by the quality of the product and the quality of the testing. On the other hand, we cannot detect the low quality product by defect count measure if we do low quality testing. So now, uh, the critical question becomes, how do we know uh, our location in the y-axis? How do we know when we are doing low quality testing and when we are doing high quality testing? Because only when we do high quality testing do we have an honest view of the software product quality. So, at this point you may want to pause this video and think about this. Can you think any measures or indicators that could indicate whether one is doing high quality or low quality testing? Now, let's jump into an example of defect detection. So, in the screen we can see two pictures. Newspapers used to publish this. I don't know if you have ever seen this one before, but this used to be very popular in the newspaper when I was a child. So, there are two identical or nearly identical pictures. The picture on the left is the correct picture. So, in Finnish, tämä on oikein. And so this is the correct picture here. And the other one has 10 defects, the one on the right. Now, your job is to find those defects. 
Also now, you can stop this video and try to search for the defects yourself, if you like. However, finding these defects really is not the point uh, of this example. The question is more, how do you know you have done a good job in finding defects in the figure? This question is the same question that is presented on the quality of testing. So how do you know when you have done low quality testing versus high quality testing? Also here you might want to pause the video and think how do you know you have done a good job in detecting these 10 defects in the figure? Now I'm going to reveal a partial solution of the testing quality problem. A possible solution is to introduce a coverage grid. So we assume that once we have inspected every one of these uh, cells in this grid, we have done good testing. We have done good job in de detecting defects in the figure. And once we reach 100% coverage, uh, the testing is good. This is the assumption here. One could go and have a discussion on the, on the size of the cells in the grid. Uh, perhaps smaller uh, size in these cells would result in more uh, accurate coverage, as it is possible to look inside a single grid and miss out a defect. Okay, let's start doing the testing this way, or the quality evaluation, or the defect detection, whatever term you prefer. So, let's have a look at the first cell in the grid. Comparing these two cells, results that there are no obvious differences. There is some difference in the shade, but this is simply due to the old newspaper format style. So this does not count. So the verdict in this case is that this is a pass. So the test case passes. There is no defect in this, in this cell. Okay, jumping on to the next cell. The inspection of these two cells reveals that there is a defect. However, I don't know, do you notice, but there is actually two defects inside this single cell, which might go unnoticed. So, they are these ones here. So, the chef's hair is missing. And also part of the menu is missing, and they are inside the same cell. And this might easily go unnoticed, uh, as one would be happy. Okay, I detected failure. I found that the chef's hair is missing. And then one would simply move on to the next cell, and might not still find the defect. This can actually happen in the real world as well, where software defects mask other defects. So if there is a lot of defects in the system, uh, the most critical defects can easily mask other defects. So when one defect gets fixed, then the underlying features uh, get revealed for more defects. So what was the point of this previous example? It tries to illustrate that the quality of testing can be seen uh, as a measure of coverage of testing. Coverage in software testing is a bit different. However, the question is the same. Have we covered a particular line of code? Have we covered a particular state 
in, in models that show how the software works. Have we covered a particular use case, scenario, or other requirements? So we can have a measure of requirement coverage. If we reach 100%, it means we have tested all the requirements. Uh, the same goes for the code that we will be, will be practiced this week. So can one reach 100% code coverage in testing? One can also take the, the feature viewpoint. So for example, one can take the user manual of a software, look into what features are available, and then with the help of a user manual, one can actually conduct quite thorough testing, uh, assuming of course that the user manual is uh, describing all the software features correctly. Inside each feature, we can consider possible input combinations. We can also consider the coverage from the viewpoint of quality attributes. So previous week, we discussed the ISO standard showing different quality attributes like security, usability, maturity, uh, and so on. So have all the quality attributes been covered in testing? We can also look into different environments. So if one is developing a web application, then the different environment one probably wishes to test this are you know, operating systems of Windows, Linux, Mac, Android, iPhone, and so on. But then one, can also, one should also consider the different browsers. So Firefox, Chrome, Opera, Safari, Internet Explorer, and so on. For example, there could be bugs that just manifest themselves if one uses Firefox on Android, for example. And this bug is only tied to this particular environment. So it is also important to cover all the different environments as well. So now I'm going to introduce two additional concepts in software testing. So typically the methods are divided to white box and black box testing. So in white box testing, we are interested in, in the internal functionality of the software. So for example, we look at the source code, we look at the execution traces that go on in the source code, and this is what is used to drive the testing. So the test cases are designed based on, based on the structure of the software. And the goal is to exercise specific internal code structure. We want to cover certain uh, criteria in the code. For example, cover all classes, all methods, all statements, all branches, and all conditions. And Different test cases then result in different execution paths. And the focus of investigation is looking at the software internals. In black box testing, however, the tests are designed based on the functional requirements and there is sort of an external perspective to the software. So the black box means that we cannot see inside this box. We cannot see what goes on. Therefore, the focus is on uh, different features and different inputs. So we look into what different inputs might we enter the system, what different features there are, and then we examine the output on whether uh, there are failures or not. So in this case, different test cases would be different features or particular inputs for, for a different feature. So in this course, the goal is to learn about different testing techniques that can help us do better testing. But what is a testing technique? So it can be defined as a procedure for selecting or designing tests. So it's a design approach or a selection approach for software. Uh, it can be based on the structural, you know, the internal model, or 
the functional model of the software. That would be the black box case. So roughly speaking, you know, structural, this is white box, functional, this is black box model of the software. Uh, obviously you should be successful at finding faults. And often there are some assumptions made on what are typical software defects. Where are the software defects typically located? And why do we care about this testing technique? Well, the goal is to do good testing. And the way we do good testing is that we maximize our coverage. Very important. However, since software engineering projects do not have endless budgets, we cannot simply focus on maximizing the coverage. We must also at the same time be concerned with the effort. So an ideal testing technique would maximize coverage while minimizing effort. In upcoming examples, we shall see that complete testing is impossible. So therefore, we must use a subset of all possible test cases. And we want this subset to have the highest probability of detecting defects. In other words, maximize coverage, minimize effort. So systematic techniques are needed to help us select and design good tests. So effective testing finds more defects, as there are planned strategies for revealing those defects. It's also efficient, uh, meaning it is cost effective. So it finds defects or faults with less effort, uh, avoids any kind of duplication that might go on in testing. Also, when we are using testing techniques, it allows us to plan and track the coverage of different tests. So if we measure, for example, requirements coverage in testing. Then we can actually plan and track how the testing is ongoing. So if we have 100 requirements and we have tested half of them, we are also aware the other half that has not been tested. So there is the added benefit of being able to measure and track software testing. Also, it is very well known that different people test software differently. So with testing techniques, we can eliminate the sort of different differences that stem from different human behaviors. And we are less uh, reliant on testers' personal skill. So the answer, how do we know that we are doing high quality testing? So one attribute of high quality testing is that it has high coverage. 